Hello and welcome to a new event in extraordinary times. For the last 15 years, we've run our annual conference, Arm TechCon, as an in-person event. This year, Dev Summit, its digital successor, is bridging the world, crossing time zones and technology communities. As a community, you are the hardware and software engineers who are using technology to change the world. I hope that Dev Summit will offer something for all of you and give you the chance to learn, connect, and develop. Some of you care more about the silicon. Some of you care more about the software. But we need all of you and us working together in collaboration to keep the tech sector advancing. Talking about advancing, let me turn to a little bit of news that was announced a few weeks back. And that news, of course, is that NVIDIA is in the process of acquiring ARM. There have been lots of headlines about the deal and plenty of misconceptions about what it really means. So let me try and clear some of that up. I'm a huge fan of the two companies becoming one, speaking as an engineer, a former CPU designer, as well as ARM's CEO. Just imagine ARM's global deployment of processor technology combined with NVIDIA's AI compute capability. We will be able to accelerate innovation, a new kind of company to unleash the world's technology potential. Importantly, it will also create an even more powerful platform on which you can build and realize your ideas. As we all know, it's ideas that fuel our world. One study concluded that each one of us has around 2,500 original ideas every day. Yet how many of those brilliant notions ever become something real? In reality, not too many. But what I do know is that some of the best ideas in our world have come from this community. You are solving all sorts of problems, and it's inspiring to see how many of you have stepped up to the challenge of the current pandemic and applied your creativity. One particular acute challenge uh, that one of our developer partners took on recently was COVID-19 virus testing. Now, meet the management team of Darwin AI, a team of computer vision experts. They saw that one of the main indicators of a serious COVID infection was lung damage, and they wanted to make a difference. Now, X-ray machines are in the front line of spotting that kind of issue, but using them is highly manual and a time-consuming process. The team thought that computer vision techniques could help. To address this, the first thing they needed was data. So they built COVID-X, an open data set of more than 14,000 lung images, some healthy and some infected. They then used this data to train their COVID-Net AI, which they did in a week. Their focus was on extreme accuracy and ensuring their AI's conclusions would be fully explainable. And that is really important, because for AI systems to become accepted, trust is paramount. From there, equipped with their algorithm and their data set, they partnered with a company called KA Imaging, who make digital X-ray machines that are powered by ARM-based chips. And that's when we got involved, helping the two companies to combine their software and hardware efficiently. To do that, we used ARMNN, a software framework we introduced in 2018 for the sole purpose of quickly mapping AI software onto ARM-based hardware. A few hours and some coding later, and the system was up and running. The team is now tuning and testing before they begin field trials of their new AI-enabled X-ray device. Hopefully, a production system is not too far away. It can't come soon enough. Now, I like the Darwin AI project for many reasons. It's designed to enhance, not replace, a doctor's wisdom, allowing clinicians to go faster and deal with more patients. Beyond that, it demonstrates how the kind of talent we have in this room makes a difference. ARM played only a tiny role in the Darwin AI project, but I feel great about that. It's the ultimate innovation, a project that can save lives. It underlines the importance of developers in this community. You take ARM-based compute, and you do amazing things with it. That's why ARM Dev Summit is so important, as it gives us the chance to exchange ideas with all of you. You can tell us where we're getting it right and where we need to do more. In line with that, we recently began a conversation with a small group of you around how you engage with our developer web platform. The people we spoke to came from diverse areas, from developers of deeply embedded IoT systems to those working in the cloud and all points in between. Here's what you told us was most important. First and foremost was performance optimization, followed by things like having fast access to information and tools that would help you find that all-important competitive edge. One developer, Unai, 
from the graphics and gaming world told us he was highly focused on how well his content runs on the ARM CPU, looking at areas like polygon reduction to smooth the graphics flow. For Unai, performance optimization is a matter of course, but that's not to say it's easy. So we at ARM must pay uh, close attention, ensuring that you have all the tools and the help you need to solve problems fast. The specific feedback is incredibly useful to us. Thank you to everyone that participated. From that feedback, we're now working on enhancing our developer platform. More self-service and faster access to assets like comparison tables, specifications, and so on. We want you to succeed, because when you win, then so do we. Now, talking about winning, the opportunities ahead for all of us are huge. The fifth wave of computing is the way I describe the confluence of AI, IoT, and 5G, technologies that are maturing together and which, alongside a seamless developer environment, can quite literally change the world. Let me give you some examples of the impact this AI-enhanced cyber infrastructure is having. AI thrives on data, and we're seeing new data pipelines being created by connected machines. Drones, for example, are now routinely used to gather information in emergency situations. This footage was taken during the recent California wildfires as fire teams battled to save forest land and protect people and their homes. Unfortunately, wildfires have become an annual occurrence for those of us living in California. This was the view from my house just a few weeks ago. Smoke had turned the sky bright orange. It was surreal. For me, it is essential that technology helps the emergency services, giving them an easy to deploy cyber data system will enable faster and more accurate decision-making, saving lives, property, and the environment. One of the biggest use cases for cyber infrastructure, I believe, will be in cities. The device on the post shown here belongs to an AI-enabled IoT network called SAGE. SAGE is supported by a group of US universities and Argonne National Labs. The goal is to build a continent-spanning network of smart sensors. Interestingly, one use case is in the early detection of wildfire smoke plumes in California. But in Chicago, SAGE has been used to gather data on the impact of urbanization. But now it's doing something else too. It's assessing how local conditions might affect the spread of COVID-19. The SAGE sensors enable a map to be created so you can see where air pollution is the highest. It then overlays reported COVID infections. The idea is to learn more about the spread of the virus, for example, by looking at the impact of heat and air quality on how it moves from person to person. SAGE projects are now springing up in other major, major cities around the world. A global cyber infrastructure like SAGE, monitoring the state of our environment, should be a part of all our tomorrows because of the good it can do. I absolutely believe in this future, and 5G will enhance our opportunities even further. Building on that, with all the factors I see in play now, I think we're moving into a period of accelerated innovation. Acceleration is something that was well understood by the engineers who built this 57-story skyscraper in just 19 days. They were able to move fast as they were using high-quality, standardized components they could trust. That's not too dissimilar to the ARM business model, where you, our partners, use our technology as a base on which to design something unique and then get to market quickly. But speed alone isn't everything. You've also got to build on firm foundations. And that takes me to three principles that underline uh, ARM's technology philosophy. Power, platform, and pervasiveness. First, power, or rather, low power. A vast cyber infrastructure brings many benefits, but unless we work at it, it will strain the world's power budget. So ARM's first instinct is always to improve power efficiency. It doesn't matter whether we're focused on ultra-high performance, like the ARM-based Fugaku supercomputer, the world's fastest supercomputer, or the most energy-efficient microcontroller cores being built into tiny chips that are just a few millimeters across and are being deployed everywhere. Whatever the application, our focus is always on how far we can push the amount of work we get done per unit of energy. And here's something we're working on that I think can raise the bar even further. Trifid is straight out of ARM's research labs. It's an experimental core now taped out in 28 nanometer, and it's at the extreme end of ultra-low power. We think Trifid will appear first in the logistics sector, 
monitoring things like food shipments. The TripIt core is so efficient that it can be powered by a single flash from an RFID reader. Any data gathered would be stored and processed on chip using non-volatile memory, which is resilient to power outages. TripIt could be monitoring how much light or heat or humidity products, products are exposed to during their journey, thereby enhancing food quality and food safety. But TripIt could also have uses way beyond shipping food, and I bet many of you are already dreaming some up right now. Following on from power, I must talk about platform. Like the super fast skyscraper engineers I showed, you all want ready access to the right components, tools, and information. That comes from a platform-based approach. And that takes me to some news I'd like to share. We're launching a new platform enhancement called ARM System Ready. It's been designed to deliver a level of consistency across a broad range of ARM-based devices, preventing wheel reinvention and enabling faster and easier software deployment from the cloud all the way to the endpoint. System Ready is well endorsed, as you can see, and dozens of ARM partners are already engaging with it. The headline benefit is that System Ready will allow a huge variety of software to just work seamlessly on ARM. We'll achieve that by tackling the common components of the software stack, elements like the operating system, the hypervisor, and middleware components. At the same time, we're addressing the system architecture with a consistent approach in areas such as boot sequences. System Ready is part of a bigger program called Project Cassini, which is about ensuring a cloud-native experience across the device ecosystem. Standardization at this level gives you the stable platform you need to accelerate innovation. Importantly, System Ready also has a secure boot option, and that's a first step for companies looking at our platform security architecture and to achieve PSA certification. You'll hear much more about this and broadly about the next steps for Cassini over the course of this week. But that's not the end of my news. I can also reveal that we're expanding our partnership with Microsoft to help reduce the friction of deploying AI on what we call endpoints, those tiny remote devices right at the edge of the network. We're building on the work we've already done together uh, to accelerate the deployment of IoT devices. Our objective is to make it easier to get the ML model you need and deploy it on the device that you want, and be assured that it just works. You'll hear a lot more about this from Microsoft themselves on day three of Dev Summit, so please do come back for that. The collaboration with Microsoft plays to my third P, pervasiveness. The ARM partnership has now shipped over 180 billion chips, and the rate of deployment increases year after year. The initiatives, such as those I've just talked about, can push that pervasiveness even further. 180 billion is a big, impressive number. But what's even more impressive is the positive impact that this pervasiveness brings. Because we always have to ask ourselves, why are we doing this? Who benefits? Well, every day I see examples of ARM-based systems that benefit people, that benefit businesses, and now with a growing focus on technology solutions for sustainability, benefit the planet. Darwin AI was one example of a set of developers channeling their creativity to address COVID-19 and save lives. But around the world, developers everywhere are innovating at a pace we've never seen before and making impacts big and small. Our job is to make it as easy as possible for you to build with ARM, to put new technology in your hands, to take on board your feedback, continually reduce friction, and hopefully inspire new ideas that lead to amazing things. The ARM community continues to grow, and I'll finish today by introducing you to some new developers who are also doing some amazing things. This project is a little different. It's been created by a group of teenagers who are part of our program called Gen arm to z Take a look at this. In 2020, ARM's Gen arm to z ambassadors were challenged with creating a technology that promotes resource efficiency and enables more people to play their part in a sustainable future. Meet PlantPal, a smart gardening system designed to tackle climate change and green space challenges by enabling people from all walks of life to cultivate their green thumb and grow their own food to perfection. Inspired by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, PlantPal is an Android app and hardware component that brings data around plant health to the palm of your hand. Currently in the proof of concept stage, here's how it would work. 
download the PlantPal app and create a login. From here, the gardening can begin. The hardware device is paired to the app using the QR code on the box cover. With the help of Raspberry Pi, POE, Microbit, and BME280, this tiny but mighty piece of AI hardware captures data points in temperature, humidity, soil moisture, and air pressure, all from a single sensor. Once plugged into plant soil, it'll transmit data to the Things Network, a cloud database platform that will connect to the app and trigger notifications on plant health. There are 12 variations of pre-built plants that can be added to my garden, and users can personalize their growing journey by naming their plants, adding details, and tracking growth. As plants grow, PlantPal will send notifications when they need water and light. Smart gardening, just one small element of a larger effort to reinvent our future cities and create a more sustainable world. Genarm to Z ambassadors Emma, Josh, Avi, and Samira, alongside their ARM mentors, Isabella, Rob, Mark, and Carl, join forces in virtual reality to take on this joint passion project. Now, I'm not much of a gardener, but even I can see the value in that idea. It's also very cool that they did it in their spare time. That's in between running their own tech companies, I'm not exaggerating, and going to school. So if you're worrying about where the next round of competition might come from for your business, well, you might have just seen it. And if you want to see a little more from them, and I recommend it, then a few of our Gen to Z ambassadors are running a panel session on Thursday. So that just leaves me to say thank you. Thank you for joining us, and thank you so much for your partnership. I do hope you enjoy the rest of Dev Summit. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the very first fireside chat at Dev Summit. Well, the big news over the last few weeks has been the intention of NVIDIA to buy ARM. And I'm really thrilled here to have my current boss, Simon Seegers, and my foreign, former boss, Jensen Wong, here to talk about that acquisition and answer all the questions you've been dying to have answered. I'm going to start with you, Jensen. So while most of the ARM ecosystem is watching here today has likely knows about this news, it would be great for them to hear from you directly why you made this decision. Why did you decide to buy ARM? Why now? Rene, we would like to create the computing company of the age of AI. As you know well, artificial intelligence is the most powerful technology force of our time. For the very first time, a computer writes, can run software that writes software by itself write software that no humans can, and achieve results that are quite spectacular. And so what we'd like to do is to unite the world leader in AI computing and the most popular CPU company in the history of computing. And by doing so, uh, we're gonna be able to, to bring our capability to the ARM ecosystem, and ARM will be able to give our accelerated computing, AI computing reach, like. Uh, not, not, you know, never, never before. And, and uh, together we'll be able to create solutions uh, that, that are going to be great for customers, whether they're in the cloud or in the edge or autonomous machines and robotics or uh, personal computing. We'll be able to create technologies and platforms that helps everybody grow. And so I think, I think everybody's going to be super excited about this. It's a great answer, and I'm glad to be asking the questions and not being questioned uh, today, so it's going to be kind of fun. <laughs> So, so Simon, Hold that thought. <laughs> you mentioned in your keynote the importance of hardware and software running <clears throat> together efficiently to enable the technological announcements, advancements of the future. How do you see our two companies working together to be able to contribute to that? Well, yeah, this uh, computing uh, computers are useless without the software that runs on them. And we're envisaging a world where there is just so much more pervasive computing than there is today, that that computing platform changing to being one uh, largely CPU driven, um, regular code, procedural code, to a world of AI where software is writing software, software is checking software, software is learning uh, from data. And that is just a completely different programming, programming paradigm. So the hardware and the software are going to come together in different ways. And I think between us, putting the strengths of the companies together, we're going to be able to address that. We're going to be able to put uh, tools into the hands of developers so that they can take all this great compute hardware and create amazing products from it. The hardware without, uh, without the software is useless, so we've got to make it really easy for those two things to come together. That's a great, great answer. A lot of folks have really loved the potential combination of the two companies technically. 
But Jensen, you know, there's been a lot of questions about ARM's business model, and we've talked to a lot of partners who have questions about what are the intentions for NVIDIA to continue that business model going forward, the ARM business model specifically. I love ARM's business model. As you know, I think the genius of ARM was the invention of this super energy efficient CPU architecture combined with this business model of licensing and having the, the wisdom of creating this vast ecosystem of uh, computer makers and chip makers in just about every industry on the planet. That, that vision took three decades to realize and I love that. I love the, I love the idea. I love the business model. I love the ecosystem that's been built. And so, so uh, I, we have every intentions of protecting it, nurturing it, and growing this, this business model. And in fact, uh, I want to add more to the business model. You know, one of the things that I really value about ARM is this network of partners and the ability of ARM to uh, take what is very difficult designs and turn it into soft IP products that people could use. And it's something that I've always wished that we could do, and uh, to take the NVIDIA architecture and to put it through an ARM's network so that uh, companies of all different sizes and shapes and, and different industries could take advantage of our IP uh, and uh, uh, allow us to extend the uh, uh, accelerated computing vision we have. Uh, to all the industries, and so I'm, I'm super excited about the... There's a follow-up on that. Another, another question that we've been getting a lot has been about the fact that you know, ARM builds GPUs, we build NPUs. Uh, everyone knows NVIDIA's GPUs are, are, are world-class. How does the acquisition affect what ARM's doing in those product areas? We're going to keep doing it. You know, we, uh, we want to give customers as many, as many choices as possible. Uh, every customer is not trying to build the same type of system, and um, uh, some of the customers would probably want to design their own. And so we, we want to give the, the customers in the market as many opportunities to innovate and differentiate as possible. So, okay. so uh, we're going to continue to, uh, to continue to advance. So it. I'm going to keep, keep with Jensen here. It's a rare opportunity that I can continue to ask you questions without you having to come back and ask me some. So I'm going to continue here. <laughs> the, 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 the I feel handcuffed. <laughs> <laughs> the, the audience for Dev Summit is uh, largely software developers. And there's a lot of developers who are part of the open source community mm -hmm. who, are, who are viewing this. Mm -hmm. Share your thoughts on how this merger of ARM and NVIDIA will help the open, so open source software development community. Well, you know that software developers uh, want several things. The, the first thing they want is they want a computing platform with a lot of capabilities um, so that they could write amazing software. That's the first thing. The second thing is they need the richness of the tools and the libraries and uh, not to reinvent everything and, and to be able to be as productive as possible. But the most important thing that software developers want is they want a, a platform with large reach that is vibrant and growing. And this is what we're going to do with our combination. We're going to combine two of the most vibrant, most exciting computing ecosystems in the world. The largest one, of course, ARM's ecosystem, and the one that is developing very quickly uh, with artificial intelligence, with NVIDIA's platform. And so we're going to be able to bring the NVIDIA developers to the reach of the ARM ecosystem, and we're going to add to the ARM ecosystem this exciting new capability called accelerated computing and AI. And so the developers are going to love it. That's, that's ultimately you know, what they wish to have, is a, a great platform with rich tools, um, but most importantly, that it has to be vibrant and rich and growing. Yep, that's a great answer. And Simon, I want to follow up on that. Um, we've obviously done a lot with open source as well, mm -hmm. uh, and also with Lenaro and questions that developers might have in terms of, A, our continued commitment to open source, and what might, if anything, change with, uh, with Lenaro going forward? Yeah, L Lenaro has been a, a really important um, a component of the overall ARM development uh, story. Um, we formed it at a time when um, open source software was starting to find its way into embedded systems, and I can remember going to talk to our partners, and they'd say, hey, we've just invested all this time optimizing the latest Linux kernel uh, to the ARM architecture, and having that same conversation like uh, every day for a week. And so there was a kind of penny drop moment for us where it's like, hey, this is crazy. We should leverage the glory of, of the ARM partnership and pool our resources to do this well. Um, and provide some of the key components of open source out to the community because that accelerates innovation. 
So that's, been, that, that's why we set up Lenara in the first place. It's been a great success. It's been great to see so many partners contribute to that. And I think it's gonna to continue to be really important as we go forwards because the open source software movement, that's here, it's growing, it's vibrant. We wanna keep it going. Uh, pivoting for a, for a different uh, type of question, Moore's Law. Mm. A lot been written about the twilight of Moore's Law that uh, ultimately this is coming to an end in terms of all the advanced geometries and complexities required with building next-gen semiconductors. When you think about that and how computing innovation could be impacted, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so from hardware, from open source software to, to, to transistors, um, it, yeah, this issue about Moore's Law slowing down, it, it's been with us for a long time. And while there's still a lot of innovation going on in uh, material science and, and semiconductor development, there's new transistor structures being, being designed as we speak. Um, one thing that's been really important is how architecture needs to evolve, how as we go forwards, um, putting different dye together that were manufactured on completely different processes in really sophisticated packaging, that all matters. Being able to stack dye together, do true 3D IC. The, these are the innovations that are gonna keep um, uh, semiconductor performance uh, improving and improving generation after generation. So as, as you know, we have a whole bunch of programs running to, to look at these, to, to work with our partners and try and address some of the really hard problems so that these advanced technologies can become mainstream, can be used by people, just to keep innovation going. Okay, this question's for both of you. Uh, both companies have talked a lot about AI, and AI being really um, part of the visions for what both of our companies will be doing in the future. Now we're thinking about a combined ARM and NVIDIA. Um, how does that change at all? And I'll start with you, Jensen, relative to how you think about AI in a combined ARM and NVIDIA world. Yeah, this is really exciting, and this you, you've you've heard uh, Simon talk about this, and I've heard him talk about it publicly now for several years. Uh, we we know that there's a there's a whole new world of computing that's about to happen. Some people call it edge, some people call it IoT. Um, the, the confluence of a, a couple of technologies are making it possible now for us to create autonomous, intelligent computers or machines that are doing skills all over the world. It could, be, it could be driving a car, it could be driving a truck, it could be moving, uh, moving crates around in a warehouse, it could be doing fast checkout, uh, it could keep keeping, keeping a, a city safe and keeping traffic flowing. It's almost as if the, the city is smart. It's almost as if the warehouse is smart. It's almost as if the retail store is smart. Now, that software that makes, the, makes them smart is called artificial intelligence, and no human knew how to write that software until recently, uh, we've m now made it possible for us to create computers, develop softwares that write the software. Now that the software is ready, now that the software is possible, we realized that, that we we're reminded of the fact that we're computer engineers and computer science enables, enables new markets, but it's up to the software developers that create the growth. Well, for the very first time, the engine of that growth is gonna come from a piece of software written by a machine. Well, machines are gonna be able, to, machines can write software a lot faster than we can, and we now know that the machines can write software that we know we can't write. And so for the very first time, it's now possible to imagine a world where we're creating these autonomous systems and computers all over the world. Uh, it's helping, uh, helping society do all, perform all kinds of tasks. The software is being written by another computer. And so the expansion of computing over the next decade is going to be far, far greater than the expansion of computing over the last decade. That's the exciting part. That's the reason why the combination makes so much sense. NVIDIA has deep artificial intelligence capability. We know how to write the software of artificial intelligence. Uh, no computing platform has the reach of ARM ever created. And so the combination, I think, is just incredibly powerful that way. Center? Yeah, I think it's about delivering on that vision. <clears throat> when you think about it, AI has kind of grown up with huge data sets running in the cloud. Uh, we've been um, enabling um, uh, endpoints and, and client devices. Um, if you try and um, take all the data from the edge of the network and you put it in the cloud and you do something with it and you send an answer back, that is massively inefficient. So computing and, and AI computing has got to go to where the data is. Uh, and, and that's what I think we've got an even greater chance on, on, of delivering on um, through the combination. Worrying about where the data lives, how we run and manage the software, where the compute is. Um, it's gonna be a vast network of computers in the future and we can deliver on that. 
So Jensen, somewhat coincidentally, mm -hmm. uh, GTC is the same week as Dev Summit. Uh, you have made an interesting ARM announcement during GTC. Tell us a bit more. Yeah, I was going to make an announcement at my show, and then and then and then uh, uh, and it was a big announcement. You know, we've been working on it all year, and and then Simon said, "Hey, why don't you come to my show?" And and I said, "All right." And so so uh, uh, at Dev Summit, we're going to announce um, a, a very big deal. So so last year, uh, we uh, uh, we put the the first uh, first stake in the ground uh, to bring Nvidia's computing to ARM. And, and it's called CUDA on CUDA NVIDIA's accelerated computing architecture to ARM, and and uh, that's a big commitment. And the reason for that is because, as you know, um, once you support software, you can't stop. That's the reason why computing platform companies uh, that understand that 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 consistency, neutrality, trust uh, uh, as part of a computing platform is so vital. Once you decide to make a commitment to an ecosystem, you can't take it back. And so we, it took us several years to come to the conclusion that, that ARM is finally at a point where it's going to evolve way past mobile devices. It's going to go into high-performance computing, into the cloud, into the edge, into autonomous machines. And that we ought to make the first, co make the first commitment uh, to bring our, our architecture to the, to the platform. Well, the response has been fantastic. All over the world, the response has been fantastic. So, so over the last year, we've been working on several things. It comes in four pillars. It goes like this. The first pillar of it is that NVIDIA is going to bring um, both our GPU as well as our DPU, our networking uh, 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 processors, and all of the system software and all the acceleration layers and all the acceleration stacks to ARM. And so that, that first commitment will complete, if you will, the ARM platform. The CPU, the GPU, the DPU, in combination, will complete a general computing platform. Number two, uh, uh, we're, gonna bring, we're gonna bring what NVIDIA's famed for, which is really domain-specific acceleration libraries to the architecture. We have three major domain-specific applications. One of them is NVIDIA HPC. This is our, our quantum chemistry, our molecular dynamics, our fluid dynamics, you know, all of our scientific computing algorithms, a thousand or so solvers in the world accelerated by CUDA, we're gonna bring all of that to the architecture. The second is NVIDIA AI. All of the frameworks, all of the deep learning algorithms, all the different, different varieties of architecture is gonna bring all of that from training to inference, second. And the third, uh, we're gonna bring NVIDIA data analytics called NVIDIA Rapids, our data analytics, data science platform. So that, that's the second pillar, all of our acceleration libraries. The third pillar is we're gonna do so in all four of the major computing platforms. High performance computing, which is a distributed multi-GPU, multi-node. Cloud computing, which is a disaggregated, composable container um, uh, microservices architecture to the edge, which is essentially a secure, autonomous data center on, on, uh, in, in a node. Uh, so the edge, robotics, and then lastly, uh, personal computing, which includes all of our graphics and all of our imaging, all of our, okay, so these four platforms we're gonna support. And we have, we have all of them running in, at, at NVIDIA. And then the last, the last pillar is uh, the ecosystem. Uh, we, uh, we've selected three uh, partners as a starting point. Uh, first is um, uh, Fujitsu with their A64FX. Uh, CPU, which is doing fantastic in, in, in uh, supercomputing. And it just kind of shows you the range of the, of the ARM architecture from embedded controllers, which is tens of milliwatts, to the fastest supercomputer on the planet. Mm -hmm. That kind of tells you uh, the, the power of this architecture during a time when Moore's Law has ended. There's nothing left to squeeze out of the system through physics, and so the only way to, only way to do it is through architecture. And so we're going to do it for um, uh, Fujitsu. We're going to do it for Ampere, the startup compute, uh, startup microprocessor company uh, that Renee James is part of. A really cool company. And then uh, Marvell with uh, with their um, uh, with their Thunder architecture, Matt Murphy's company. And they're doing great. And so, so, so the four pillars. And you take the permutation of all that. That is the complexity of a computing platform, as you know. You take the permutation of all of that. Uh, you have processors, you have systems, you have libraries, and you have ecosystem, uh, and uh, we'll support it for as long as, as as long as we shall live. 
Very exciting. I know the partnership is going to be thrilled mm -hmm. to, to yeah. see that kind of breath. Uh, another uh, area that people are, I think, thirsty for some more details uh, around this Center for AI Excellence in Cambridge, uh -huh, uh -huh. that when the uh, announcement was made about uh, a few weeks back, uh, has really got people curious about what that is, what it's going to mean, and what's NVIDIA's commitment to it. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, you, you know that, that um, you know, I was going to make another announcement at, 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 my, at my show. <laughs> I, I, if I told you the story now, um, okay, I'll, I'll tell you, and we'll just keep it among our, ourselves until, until I announce it again. Okay, so it kind of goes like this. Did you know that Cambridge is simultaneously the home of the beginning of computing, of course, right? And also the beginning of the DNA, of course you know mm -hmm. that. It is the reason why, why um, Cambridge uh, is a hotbed uh, and epicenter of genomics AI research. Well, what, what the UK needs, what Cambridge needs, and what that whole ecosystem of partners need, researchers need, is a supercomputer. And so, so uh, we're going to go build uh, uh, a brand new supercomputer, the fastest supercomputer in all of the UK, and we're gonna dedicate it to genomics, uh, computational genomics, computational drug discovery. And we have five founding partners, uh, including ARM. Uh, the, the five founding partners are uh, GSK, uh, AstraZeneca, King's College, the UK Biobank, Informatics Bank, Oxford Nanoport. A genomics company. And so these four, five companies are going to join us to, uh, to uh, 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 develop this um, uh, new AI system. Uh, we've created a brand new uh, computational drug discovery stack. Uh, the, 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 the mathematics, uh, the algorithms, incredibly complex, and uh, uh, the suite of software uh, that we're going to bring to bear is, is really, really exciting. And so we're going to have a computer, we're going to have all kinds of uh, tools. Uh, just like EDA tools and you know AI tools uh, that are used for uh, drug discovery, and um, and a bunch of partners to help us. You know. Super exciting. Yeah. Last question. Going to take it away from the area of uh, drug research, genomics, AI, and talk about the the deal at hand. A lot of questions that we've got from folks just relative to the regulatory process and how you both view uh, what that's going to be like and your confidence level that ultimately this, uh, this acquisition will be approved. And I'll start with you, Jensen, and, and have you wrap no, up. let's now. have start with Simon. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Since you wrote the check, we'll start with Jensen. <laughs> that it's true, it's true. Somebody, somebody just said to me the other day that, that you paid an arm and a leg. Yeah. I thought it was clever. <laughs> Uh, and, but true, but, but, but true. It wasn't our clever. PR department. So. Yeah, clever, <laughs> clever and true, uh, but worth every penny and more. Uh, uh, I, I am confident, we are confident that it's going to go through. And the, and the, reason, the reason for that is because uh, as, soon, as soon as we explain uh, the rationale of, of the transaction um, and, and our plans, uh, the regulators around the world will realize that the, these are two complementary companies. You know, a lot of companies, they, they just know there are two technology companies coming together. They don't really understand what it is that we do. And, and so, so the first thing is to explain what we do, uh, where we belong in the ecosystem. Uh, people realize that we're a complementary company. The two companies being complementary when combined uh, will create new innovations, which is good for the market. It drives innovation forward. It's good for customers. Uh, and when they, when they realize that, that uh, we love the business model, we're going to protect the business model, we're going to create... Uh, continue to nurture this 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 neutral, um, uh, committed, consistent, trusted uh, platform, so that so that uh, our ecosystem can continue to flourish and even grow. Um, I, I think when people realize that, uh, they, they're gonna they're gonna be really quite quite excited about it. This is a deal that's about expanding. It's about creating new, more and new technology. It's about putting that technology in the hands of people who are going to build really cool stuff with it. Um, so from that point of view, this is about uh, enabling more people to do more things. So that, that's a positive thing that as regulators do scrutinize this, they're, they're going to be able to see. Now, I'm sure it's going to take a while. Um, you know, when you look at the, the breadth and the position that both companies play in the industry, it's, it's the right thing that regulators apply a lot of scrutiny. They look at what we're doing. Everybody gets comfortable. So there's a process to go through. It's, a, it's absolutely the right thing that the process is done really thoroughly. But I think we're going to get to the end of that. Everyone's going to realize that this is a good thing for expanding 
um, and that we'll get approval. Great, thank you both. And uh, Simon, thank you. Jensen, thank you. <clears throat> for the two CEOs allowing me to be chairman for 30 minutes. Uh, <laughs> thank you for uh, allowing me to ask you all these questions and your honest answers. And on to the rest of Dev Summit. I hope that this was beneficial to you. It was really uh, good for me and cool for me to listen to the answers from uh, both these two gentlemen. And uh, as I can say, I'm personally really excited about the, uh, the future ahead. Thanks very much. Hi, I'm Mark and I lead the open source software team. Today, I'd like to talk to you about software in the ARM ecosystem, how things have changed over the years, and where I see things going. Spoiler alert, ARM technology is everywhere. So you may well be an ARM developer already, but if you aren't, in my opinion, you may well soon be. ARM is an unusual company that you may not be familiar with, so I'll give you a quick introduction. I'll use this prop from the British TV show Doctor Who to explain. The TARDIS is the time travel machine used in all the stories. On the outside, it looks like a fairly unassuming police box from 1960s Britain. On the inside, it's a futuristic palace that seems to expand in all directions. The strange thing is, it's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. To me, ARM feels like an inverse TARDIS. Looking from the outside, ARM looks massive. Touching every corner of the computing universe, 95% of the world's phones, 90% of the wearables, etc., etc. But then you look inside. We've a total of around 6,500 employees, and a large portion are dedicated to R&D. That's not a lot of people when you consider our reach. Our success has come from building partnerships and contributing to ecosystems. Together, this enables us to become larger than the sum of our parts. Being an ARM developer, let alone being an ARM employee, kind of crept up on me. In my early career, I worked across the embedded space, building systems from wind tunnels to broadband networking. The one common challenge was getting that base software up and running and keeping it stable. A wide variety of CPUs meant a wide variety of tools and source trees. Everything was a one-off project, varying quality BSPs proliferated on different versions of different OSs. Once the product was delivered, it went on the shelf and you moved on to the next thing. As smartphones started to emerge, I joined Symbian. At that point, everything I worked on became ARM-based. And then six years ago, I joined ARM to lead the open source software team. Mobile devices have become the primary portal to the internet, a large part of the way we socialize and a popular gaming platform. It's really become the personal computer. If you want to be where new technology and applications are being created, you have to be developing for ARM. And now IoT is taking off. ARM development is ramping up in automotive and equipment companies. Even white goods manufacturers now have ARM developers. It feels strange referring to a car or robot as a device, but they share similar attributes and challenges to the simplest of IoT devices and can be solved in similar ways. You're also seeing cloud and high-performance compute gravitate towards ARM. Cloud native is eroding barriers for moving applications between architectures. In essence, everything that's cloud native should just work on ARM. And with edge computing, you've the merge of infrastructure and IoT technologies where the natural diversity of the ARM ecosystem presents the ideal set of solutions, in my view. This brings me to the final frontier. Yes, the PC. Ironically, ARM started in PCs. We were part of Acorn, once one of the UK's premier vendors. As kids in the 1980s, my brother and I loved our BBC Model B. There are some great ARM-based PCs already out there focused on the consumer space. I've got a couple of them that I use every day that run Windows or Chrome OS. Developers, though, need a different configuration. Fast CPUs, 16 gigabytes of RAM, 512 gigabytes of fast storage, bigger screens and standard keyboards you can use for prolonged periods of time that will run Windows or Linux or both. But why do we care about ARM-based PCs for developers? Well, because that's where you do your magic. 
it would be much easier for everyone if you could write software for ARM on an ARM system and debug ARM code on an ARM machine. All I can say is we're working on it. And I believe the world needs an ARM developer spec machine. And it's my personal goal to make this happen. The good news is that you're not alone. Our largest partners have several thousand developers, each dedicated to developing for ARM. There could be a couple of hundred thousand engineers in this space alone. Then there are the large software franchises that predominantly develop for ARM. Then, as Evans Data Group estimates, there are 24 million developers in the world and 13 million identifies as mobile developers, which is mostly ARM-based. Then consider the move to architecture neutral software in the infrastructure space and the number jumps again. Put another way, if you're an ARM developer, you're already part of a majority. You could say the explosion of software developers is happening inside ARM too. In the past, hardware might have outnumbered software in ARM by 4 to 1. Now it's closer to 1 to 1. Our software efforts are largely focused on enabling and optimizing for the ARM architecture and the hardware we license to our partners. We work in the most widely used software components and enable the developer ecosystem with IDEs, models, compilers, and debuggers. You'll see a substantial software optimization effort also for total compute. Here we're shifting from concentrating on absolute performance to focusing on optimizing behaviors for specific use cases. It's a very different mentality and it will give rise to new ways of thinking and optimizing software. We're also working hard on compatibility. Our vision is for software that just works seamlessly across a vibrant and diverse ecosystem of hardware. That means more work in the firmware space, more work in OSs, containers, hypervisor, and further up the stack. The more we can standardize in these lower layers, the less others need to do, and the better the life of the developer becomes in general. But because of the inverse TARDIS I mentioned earlier, we can't do all of this on our own. That's why we created Lanaro. For those not familiar with Lanaro, Lanaro is a collaborative engineering organization funded by key companies from around the ecosystem to solve some of the most challenging problems that arise when we enable such a diverse array of hardware as is created by the ARM partnership. Lanaro is a top 10 contributor to the Linux kernel, but that's only one of the many open source projects they contribute to. Solving hard problems isn't something you want to do on your own. You need to bring people together, and that's what Lanaro does best. But now for the bad news. We've got a few challenges ahead. Computing right now, I believe, is undergoing a compelling demographic shift. Namely, machines are quickly becoming a bigger part of the digital population. Online, IoT devices already exceed the number of humans, moving towards the global cyber infrastructure that Simon has just talked about. IDC predicts that 500 million new applications and digital services will be developed and deployed using cloud-native approaches between now and 2023. That's as many applications as were invented in the first 40 years of digital technology. And because we don't have that many developers in the world, many of those applications will be made by machine. And the proliferation of the cloud, edge servers, and intelligent devices means that there will be far more computers out there than there are today, with many making critical decisions via AI. Over the air, automated, secure upgrades will have to become the norm. The smartphone experience, I believe, will become a template for other industries. Unlike the PC, the smartphone world didn't go through a phase where it trusted users to do the right thing. The long tail theory has been at the root of a number of product strategies. But in connected devices, it's a looming problem. Think of a smart speaker or camera. A manufacturer might want to provide two years of continuous service. In their mind, that's the lifetime of the product. But to the consumer, the lifetime might be 5, 10, or even 15 years. Now, technically, this is a solvable problem. But it's going to require a change of mindset. Companies are going to have to come up with ways to make lifetime support more sustainable. It's even worse when you look at industrial IoT or automotive. 
cars in North America and Europe stay on the road for an average of 10 to 12 years. But it's not the average to worry about. The lifetime of a car could be expected to be 20 years or more. And that's nothing compared to the power grid. The average age of a large power transformer in the US is now around 45 years. You could be long retired by the time your handiwork is replaced. Of course, in the disconnected world, lifetime supports a solved problem. The automotive industry, for an example, knows how to do this very, very well. But for the connected world, it gets much harder. Cybercrime. With something like an autonomous machine that marries data center workloads to safety critical systems, imagine what would happen if we haven't solved secure and safe updatability for the lifetime of the device. There'll be a hacker's dream in time, misdirecting, creating phantom obstacles, or something far, far worse. We're working hard to help with these problems. PSA Certified offers a security framework and certification scheme to standardize some of the most important security features, services, and APIs. PSA Certified started out addressing the constrained IoT space, but we're now working with the ecosystem to extend it to the other connected segments we operate in. System Ready is complementary to PSA Certified, focusing on device design and compatibility, giving you and your customers a blueprint for a platform on which you can easily land your applications. Both PSA Certified and System Ready are also pillars of Project Cassini, a library of sorts for building compatible edge devices. We're also delivering support for the hardware that ARM develops into the upstreams, where they're needed, like the Linux kernel or trustedfirmware.org projects, among many others. These things together should greatly reduce the amount of low-level bespoke code required to build that base of any system, which over time, the lifetime of the device, should reduce the cost of ownership substantially if you adopt them. As a call to action, what do we need you to do? First, engage with the standards and work out how you'll adopt them. Second, consider the nature of lifetime commitment you're going to be making with your products and how you'll update them for the consumer's lifetime expectations. But don't just consider the device. Think about how that device will be managed. Third, Look at what technologies add value to your products and which should be handled by common frameworks. And get as much non-differentiated code either from the upstream or contribute it there so you're able to move to newer versions of software at a lower cost. This isn't all solved yet. Some of these issues will require technical breakthroughs, but others will require a change of approach from us as developers. You're going to need to think about lifetime support and how that fits with your commercial model for your product. Best to factor that in from the start. So please consider how you'll do this and what ARM can do to help. Hardware and software have always had an edgy relationship. Software developers may joke that hardware without software is just expensive sand. The real value, what everybody wants, is the content that's embodied in the software. Hardware engineers will reply that software on its own is the greatest movie you'll never see. Without hardware to play it back, you're just sitting in the dark. Of course, both sides are right and wrong at the same time. Software and hardware are inextricably bound together. And when you bring the two together in the right way, the results can be magical. Most of us likely went into technology because of a product or invention that left us absolutely speechless as a child. And to me, that's why being part of the ARM ecosystem is so exciting. I do hope you share some of this feeling with me. Although Dev Summit's a virtual conference, there's plenty to explore. So please check out the technical sessions, the keynotes, and the pavilions. We're at the first stages of the next generation of technology. And my hope is that by collaborating and sharing at events like this, we can come up with those breakthrough ideas that one day leave others speechless. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I am super excited about what we have to bring for you today. I'm Chris Berge. I'm the Senior Vice President and General Manager of Infrastructure at ARM. And I've got quite an exciting panel with me today. First, I'd like to introduce Don. Don, could you introduce yourself? 
Hi, yeah, I'm Don McCaskill. I'm the co-founder, CEO, and chief geek at SmugMug, um, and we also operate Flickr. Awesome, thanks, Don. I always, I wish I, my, my title was chief geek, but uh, it's something to aspire to someday. Uh, secondly, we've got Liz Fong-Jones. Liz, could you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Liz Fong Jones. I'm the principal developer advocate at Honeycomb.io, which is a developer tools software as a service company. Awesome. Thanks for joining us today, Liz. Last but not least, I have Dave Brown. Dave, could you introduce yourself? Hey, Chris. So I'm Dave. I'm the vice president of Amazon EC2 over here at Amazon Web Services. Amazon EC2. I think I might have heard of that. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Th thanks everybody for joining us. And uh, what we wanted to have here is uh, an open round table. We're gonna be kind of discussing about uh, moving to the cloud and obviously arm in the cloud and some of the impacts. So I'm gonna start it out with Dave. And Dave, can you tell me about why is AWS building ARM-based CPUs such as Graviton2? Our journey with ARM actually started um, back in 2012, 2013 when we started to look at ways of improving performance um, across EC2 by offloading a lot of the functionality that we traditionally ran on the underlying server to actually an ARM chip running on an offload card. And so since 2012, we've been moving more and more of our system, uh, system processing off to this offload card. And um, that was a project that ultimately culminated in what became known as the Nitro system. And today, AWS runs an enormous amount of application infrastructure on ARM, uh, sort of underneath all of the services. And so that ultimately got us thinking, uh, obviously, you know, where ARM was going, the performance we were seeing from ARM, could, we could actually provide a, a server chip with an ARM core to our customers um, to use as, as an instance type on AWS. And so we launched our very first one um, back in 2018, which was known as our Graviton 1 CPU. Uh, we didn't have the one back then, which is called Graviton, didn't need the version number. But then last year in 2019, we actually launched Graviton 2, um, which is our new ARM chip and just providing incredible performance for our customers. And so from a price performance point of view, um, the ARM processor there is actually providing 40% benefit um, over other instance types uh, of the equivalent family um, within AWS today. And so it's really just focusing on, let's continue to innovate um, in all the areas we can. And so it's been incredible to innovate together with the team at ARM um, down at the silicon level and actually building a chip that, that's suitable for, you know, for the cloud and, and for, the server, for the server chip, um, and then be able to bring that value to our customer base. That's great. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Don, can you give me your perspective of, uh, you know, you obviously gave Graviton 1, I believe, and even Graviton 2 a whirl. Can you kind of give me a, a background of why would you take that step? Yeah, well, um, you know, we've been interested in um, ARM for servers for a long, long time. I remember we took our first sort of um, swing at the bat playing around with some C-Micro um, servers using ARM, I think it was 2009, 2010 kind of time frame. So uh, we've been acutely interested for a long time. And as soon as we found out that uh, AWS is gonna be bringing Graviton to their offerings a couple of years ago, we got extremely excited um, because we've long believed we'd be able to deliver um, similar performance at, at massively reduced cost by leveraging ARM. So many of our, of our compute workloads aren't really CPU bound. They're really bound um, by other things like memory bandwidth and network IO and, and storage IO and everything. And so we're essentially, we knew, we've known for years that we we're kind of overpaying for um, super premium compute that we're not actually maximizing. And uh, so we are really excited to um, just get something that was considerably lower cost that could still operate those workloads. Um, and then we were kind of pleasantly surprised that not only does it do those things, but it's also an incredible CPU. Like we thought we were going to have to sacrifice performance to, um, to drive value. And instead we got both. Pretty exciting. Don, that's pretty powerful to hear from you, your kind of customer experience there. Dave, what are, what are your other customers telling you about Graviton2? I mean, has it been a rocky road? What, what kind of experience have they had? It's actually been really great feedback. You know, when we, we, we built the chip, we taped it out, we got our first few chips back. Um, we, we ourselves were very impressed and very surprised at the performance. We knew it was going to be good. Uh, we, didn't, you know, we didn't expect what we saw. And so, you know, in, in the benchmarks that we run, and we always have to be careful with benchmarks, right? Benchmarks are often abused in interesting ways, but the benchmarks we ran, um, you know, show about a 40% price performance improvement for most workloads. Some are, some are more and some are less. 
And honestly, that's the feedback we've been getting from our customer base is, um, you know, whether it's a standard sort of compiled code like C and C++, they've seen about a 40% um, Java interpreted workloads are seeing, you know, upwards of 40%, sometimes a little higher than that. Um, and it's just customers are coming back and saying, wow, we've seen this performance, um, you know, that, that, that was advertised from Graviton 2. And so that's really, really exciting to see. Thanks, Dave. That's helpful to understand. Liz, you've had some experience with Graviton 2. Could you share that with the team? So at Honeycomb, we started adopting Graviton 2 about eight or nine months ago. And we started uh, really pushing Graviton 2 out to all of our customers within the past three to four months. And it's definitely been worth it from a perspective because we see over 20%, 30% performance gains per machine, and each machine is 20% less in cost. And that enables us to both deliver innovative features for our customers, and as well as keeping the cost of our service low. That's great, Liz. How, can you tell us about the transition? I mean, how painful was it? How long did it take? The initial prototyping took about two to three weeks of wall time. And a lot of that was spent chasing down compatibility in the operating system layer rather than in our application itself. Our applications uh, are native Go, and therefore our code just compiled with a single uh, environment flag telling it to compile for ARM64. So that was the easy part. The harder part was integrating and gluing all the pieces together. Thanks, Liz. Don, how, how about you? How was the experience in making the transition? Was it painful? Uh, you know, it, it was remarkably easy. Um, so Graviton 1, we started to move a couple of big workloads to it um, right at launch, I guess maybe a, a few weeks or months before launch, um, like two years ago. And, uh, and it took us about two weeks to get that first sort of large production workload up and running. Um, and it was mostly just kind of an ecosystem thing. We thought it would take a lot longer because we didn't, we didn't think we could find, you know, a Linux distribution with all the packages and all of that sort of stuff that we thought we would need to, to run our applications. Um, it turned out that most of that just worked. It was already compiled. There were packages for lots of different architectures, including ARM. Um, and so it just took a couple of weeks of sort of cobbling it together, working through all the dependencies, making sure that we had um, sort of tested everything um, was working like we expected. And then, and then we launched on uh, Graviton 1. When Graviton 2 came around a few months back, um, that was a one day switch for us. All of our existing Graviton 1 workloads were just one day we put them in dev, we put them in test and rolled them to production and it was really that fast. We didn't have to do anything. Um, our, uh, our, our primary workloads are PHP and Java, um, which I'm sure helped quite a bit. There was you know, essentially no recompiling. We just grabbed uh, ARM versions of PHP and Java and, and away we went. It was pretty awesome. Liz, can you talk about the software ecosystem and, and how that kind of relates to, you know, the Honeycomb IO strategy or what you, what you see kind of as a future path forward? Yeah, I think that with regard to the software ecosystem, there are challenges around making sure that system administration binaries are available because historically a lot of the work around uh, Linux for ARM has been focused on environments like the Raspberry Pi. So kind of some of the work that I had to do in collaboration with colleagues and friends was, for instance, making sure that we had uh, visibility into the security uh, aspects of our system. Can we run OS queries successfully? Uh, can we actually execute Chef and have all of the Chef recipes we depend upon execute successfully? So that was really where a lot of the challenge was. The challenge was not really in the, you know, can I, can I write the software and have it run? It was kind of all the scaffolding and infrastructure around it. That's cool, Liz. I gotta say, it's um, I, I'm a Twitter geek. To be honest with you, I'm totally addicted. And one of the fun things for me to track in you know every day is to wake up and see what new people are trying out Graviton two and what their experience was, and and now how they're kind of really helping that ecosystem flywheel. And uh, Dave, are you seeing that? Do you see the software ecosystem for ARM evolving, or what? What is what are your customers telling you? Absolutely. And honestly, I think it's growing a lot faster than we expected, right? We, we knew when we were working on the, on the CPU, on the chip, that, that we knew that we'd have to grow the ecosystem. You go back to 2017, it was starting to grow, but, you know, it was a challenge. And I think that's the expectation that, you, you know, both Don and Liz mentioned, they thought it would be harder than it was. Well, back then, there wasn't much of an ecosystem. And, and that was honestly the, the major driving force behind us putting out Graviton 1. And we put that out there um, because we wanted to drive that ecosystem. We wanted to say, ARM is in the cloud. Let's really get that ecosystem going. And what we saw in that first year was just incredible, right? Where, from an operating system point of view, we saw all the large Linux distros 
um, be able to support support ARM um, on the container space, which is obviously critically important today. We saw a lot of the container runtimes being able to support ARM as well. Um, in the open source community, we saw a lot of the, the kind of key packages that you know customers rely on and build into the applications move to support ARM. And so, just across the ecosystem, you know, we just saw and we also saw a lot of the AWS services uh, take the opportunity back then to move and support ARM as well to make sure we were ready, whether it's an agent-based service or or another high-level service to be able to support customers. And what that meant is through 2018 and 2019, that ecosystem really grew quickly. And so by the time we put out Graviton 2 um, towards the end of 2019 and through the early part of 2020, um, with our very latest uh, uh, compute optimized instance, the ecosystem's there. And so, you know, in most of my conversations with customers, um, it's there's an expectation that it's going to be a lot more difficult than it actually is. And so my advice to them is very often, take one or two engineers, and go and tell them to build, you know, build this application for ARM. Go and take the Linux distro that's been compiled for ARM. Go and take your application and just see what happens. And uh, Don's statement where he said it took him one day, um, it literally was, I believe, a tweet that told me the very next day that they were now running the entire production system on Graviton 2, the day after we launched. So it was very impressive to see. <laughs> Hey, Don, as a CEO, um, you know, obviously there's things in your business that you can optimize that really make a difference to the bottom line. And there's things you can optimize that, you know, won't make really move the needle. Uh, can you give kind of a perspective as, as a CEO of a digital company like you are? I mean, does this move the needle? Is, is this important to you or is this just an optimization because you're chief geek and you want to say you're running on ARM? Yeah, no. Um, I mean, it, it's both. <laughs> I'm... There's a reason I've been following sort of the ARM ecosystem so long because I am geeky about it. But, you know, it, it's not very often that a piece of technology comes around um, that that you're using at scale and you can just cut 40% of the cost right out of it. Like no negotiation, no contract, no commit, no term. Like you just recompile and you're saving 40%. Like. It just doesn't happen. I, I can't remember the last time it's happened. Um, so, so it is both. I That's definitely awesome. echo that too. Um, what I definitely say is if you can give your startup that extra month of runway, or if you can deliver that breakout feature that is only possible because you're able to get compute that's twice as cheap as anywhere else, like you better do it because that's the health of your business at stake. That, that's exciting. Yeah, I, my, my own personal experience is I actually had a call with one of the CIOs from one of the larger companies in Silicon Valley. And, and you know, I was kind of hoping for a nice technical exchange and it, it wasn't. But I, when I for introduced him to Graviton, I mean, he was like, this was the best meeting he had had all week. And I was like, well, wait, we didn't really talk about that much. But it just hit me like what a big change this was for them. And obviously, you know, for CEOs, CFOs, CIOs, CTOs, I mean, cost in the cloud, it, it's awesome what Dave and, and the team at AWS are providing, but it's also like a credit card, right? You get the bill at the end of the month and, and, and you do want to keep, keep your costs in check with the services you're providing. Don, what's your view of the, the role, the future role of the ARM architecture and kind of the future of cloud? I mean, you, you, you mentioned you were, I think you were even one of the earlier AWS customers, if, I, if I'm not wrong. Um, where, where does this go? I mean, you've clearly been on the, you know, early in on the cloud wave and, and where do you think things go from here? So we were a very early um, AWS customer. We, we um, uh, were using it in production before it was even launched and announced um, with S3 in 2006. Um, and, you know, I think one of the amazing things that um, particularly cloud computing has enabled is, is um, lots and lots of um, highly customized heterogeneous compute, right? Um, we're running lots and lots of different clusters on lots of different instance types because we can really fine tune exactly what our CPU to memory ratio is or how big of a network interface we need or whether we need a GPU or, um, or other you know, customized hardware. Um, and so uh, I think one of the things I'm super excited about is um, AWS has continued to kind of roll out additional instance classes based on Graviton 2, right? They came out with sort of one class, but now there are many classes and they are, um, you know, going down that same road where now you can start to mix and match your, your um, memory and your, your storage and things. So I'm really excited to see more of that. Um, I want to see Graviton 2 paired with uh, GPUs and paired with um, giant NVMe storage and all kinds of things like that, which 
I have to imagine are are in the works because that's what AWS has been doing with EC2 for you know more than a decade is adding more and different and fine fine tunable um, parts. So pretty excited about what the future looks like where essentially you can get Graviton2 paired with just about any other mix of, of additional components you might need for a very specific compute workload. From an instant point of view, I think, you know, Liz, you mentioned kind of a startup view of getting additional runway. I mean, that, that, that tugs at my heartstrings, you know, doing a couple startups myself. But Dave, did I hear right that there's actually um, some instant types where people can actually try out Graviton 2 for free? Yes, Chris. Um, so, so we actually, last week, we actually launched our T4G, um, which is our oversubscribed instance um, that allows customers to try Graviton. Um, it's really it's our, lo our lowest cost instance type um, and, and experience the Graviton performance. But more importantly, we actually launched um, a trial period with that as well. And so until the end of this year, um, customers are able to launch a Graviton instance um, and get 750 hours per month um, free on the T4G instance type. That's really wow. exciting to me, given that you just advocated, you know, hey, take a week or two, take an engineer or two and just spin it up. Now people don't have to ask for permission to do it. They can just do it. Yes, and so much in the cloud actually happens that way, Liz, right? It's just an engineer trying something on the side they're able to do. Uh, and we see a lot of innovation, lots of great stories behind that. So excited to see what customers do. Liz, what else do you think that, you know, what do you see as the longer term impact of ARM in the cloud or, um, you know, kind of the evolution of cloud? The thing that I'm really excited about is that Graviton 2 is, Amazon's not necessarily saying this, but, you know, it's better price per compute. And that's also uh, watts per compute, right? So I think that all of us have to be really, really conscious of our carbon impact. And for me, part of what motivated me to explore Graviton 2 was the desire not just to save money, but to do better by the environment and to really empower people to do innovative things without hurting the planet quite as much. Well, I really appreciate you all being with us. And I really would like to thank Dave and Don and Liz for joining me. This has been a tremendously valuable learning experience for myself and, I'm, and I believe for the larger ARM Dev Summit audience. But thank you all for being with us today.